right, part three. What is this right here? Part three, we're going to talk a little bit about the British service uniform uh, in World War One, And this is your typical uh, British uh, enlisted men's service tunic. It's model 1902 tunic. Very similar looking to the American uh, uniform. What's our uh, on the buttons? Oh, those are probably the uh, it's probably the uh, coat of arms, British Army coat of arms. I'm not really actually sure on the buttons. Okay. This is pretty much just a lion. It's a lion crest. It's... Now the British use both straight leg trousers and and breeches, uh, but most of the uh, infantrymen wore a straight leg trouser. Interesting enough, though, by the close of World War One, the U.S. Army was getting away from breeches and going to straight leg trousers, very similar to the um, British World War One trouser. Um, once again, they also had adopted a overseas cap, very similar to the French and the American. But prior to any helmets, British service soldiers wore what was called a trench cap, soft trench cap. Here's a typical service cap that was worn mm -hmm. by the French, uh, I'm sorry, by the British, British. British forces. Uh, personal uh, field dressing. All that would be carried in, a, in one of the pockets in the service tunic. Uh, your puttees. Mm -hmm. These are referred to as ammunition shoes. Why it's ammunition pretty, shoes? This is a term that they gave. Uh, they, these shoes were pretty much the same all the way up through World War II and a little bit later. Not much of a change there. British equipment, a survival rate or, uh, in collections is very rare. I mean, I have real basics here. Uh, to locate original British World War I equipment is very difficult. Uh, this is an interesting little item. This is an original. This is the, uh, these were given out in uh, 1916 to uh, the soldiers at the front and they contained uh, chocolates and candies and sometimes cigarettes. They were given as a Christmas presents to the uh, soldiers. Uh, this is actually an original, one of the original tins and every soldier was, was distributed one of these in Christmas. I think it was 19 uh, sorry, 1914. Christmas of 1914. These came as Christmas presents from uh, from uh, Princess Mary. Okay. And this is this is a clasp clasp knife, British uh, World War One clasp knife. Mm -hmm. There's a set of very rare British World War One dog tags, and they were made of a fiber board. Uh, there was a red one and a green one. Oh wow, early dog tags. Yes, uh, I neglected to bring the American ones. The American ones were very similar to that. Now what are these right over here? Those are different hat badges for the different uh, units within the British Army. Uh, there's a tank corps one there. This is uh, Grenadier Rifles, a senior rifle company in the British Army. Uh, and these are all different units. They all had their own crest. There's still one here on this, this particular hat here. So, so that's an example that you that's, put on. Yeah, the hats usually wore a crest in the front. Okay. And this right here just shows an example. Here's a typical British soldier, beginning of the war. Now he's wearing uh, the service uniform we actually just described. Plus, he has, and we'll go over this next, the P08 web gear. Okay, P08, okay. P pattern 1908 or P08 web gear, and he's armed with a short model Lee Enfield rifle. So he's got his, his puttees, his ammunition shoes, service cap, he's got his 1902 service uniform on, and then we're going to talk a little bit now about uh, the, the uh, field gear. Okay. Um, What's this right here? Typical British mess kit. These hadn't changed since the Crimean War. In fact, oh. some of these, yes, they haven't changed since the, almost the 1850s. Uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> yeah, it is not broke, don't fix it. Uh, they were issued a, a porcelain mug or tea mug. It's okay. called a tea mug. Uh, and then, um, like I said, uh, you know, British stuff is really difficult to find because it got used up and sent out to the colonies. Um, so I'm kind of short on a lot of the uh, amenities that a British soldier carried. But um, the, the POA gear here, which is it's all assembled, which probably cuts down the space. This is your entire set of pattern 1908 web gear. Now, it was designed, it's a very interesting setup. You had a cartridge belt, and then everything, you had to slide to two ammunition pouches on. There was a left and there was a right. From that, all the equipment hooked onto it. Uh, it was a neat setup. It had to be actually put on like a jacket and taken off like a jacket. Now, this is actually set up more for the marching order and not campaign order. Um, and I'll just explain that after. Marching order, it usually had a large knapsack or backpack on the back. 
In the center would be carried the tool health or entrenching tool health carrier. Okay. And there's one of them over here off the pack. Okay. And on the left side would have been the haversack where you would carry your food. Also on here would be the is the uh, is the bayonet frog for the bayonet for the short model EN field. Mm -hmm. And then your one set of ammunition pouches to carry the clips for the, the short model EN field. On the other side, you had your your right carrier, and off of that carrier was your bottle, your water bottle. So all this is all put together, it's all together, so it's put on, take it off, put on, and take it off like a jacket. I think we missed one part, actually two. Uh, we'll These right we'll here. Mm -hmm. right. uh, here's here is your British World War One pattern Brody helmet. Now it differs a little bit from the American version, but really the only difference is, is the British version. And if you ever come across one, you see a round rubber ring inside. That is a British manufactured helmet. It has the same type of oil cloth liner and a cheese cloth inside leather strap. Uh, these liners were not very. Uh, these liners were not very. Um, very strong. They tend to, when you find these helmets, they're usually just shells now. Yeah. But this is what we patterned our model 1917 helmet out of. Uh, jumping back over here, here's your typical, um, this is the British fragmentation grenade, or what's called the Mills bomb. This is a model 19, this is a number five, which is for hand use only. And then they had an M28 or a, 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 a pattern 28 and a pattern 36, an M36. Uh, they were designed to be fired from rifles. So this is your 19, uh, this is your number five Mills bomb. And this is just a... Uh uh, this is structure, structure, manual. Manual. structure manual for assembling the, the pattern uh, 1908 okay. gear. All right, next is going to be French. When, get, when, when it comes to this, when, when you start to get into the British and French stuff in, in this country, it gets difficult to find because uh, you know it's not it's not native to the United States, so it gets a little difficult when you get down at this point. But here's your French uniforms of the First World War. Uh, it's in what's called Horizon Blue. This is the overcoat uh, or trench coat. This was the primary garment that would be worn at all times. It's a knee length coat, double breasted. It's in what's called Horizon Blue. This color replaced the navy blue that was worn the first year of the war. Uh, navy blue with marauder red pants. Then later on in 1915, uh, or beginning end of 14, they started to go over to a Horizon Blue uniform. Okay. This is what the French stayed with pretty much. They also made a shorter version or a tunic. This is the shorter coat. It only comes up to about your waist. Uh, they were to be allowed to be worn uh, behind the lines, but they were not to be worn as a combat garment. The trench coat, a long coat, was supposed to be worn at all times. Uh, but you will see, even though that was the case, you will see uh, the, the short tunic being worn by infantrymen uh, okay. out of regulation. Uh, trousers also were horizon blue. They were on a, they were like breeches. They were close fitting to the calves. French Army yellow designated infantry. We all had yellow piping on them for infantry. What are their colors are with their being? Um, I believe yellow uh, is infantry. I don't know if cavalry used the same. I know uh, artillery was red. Okay. Um, but this is infantry pipe for infantry. Okay. Uh, this is one style or version of their overseas cap. This is a little bit more of a squared version. Um, they did have other versions that look a lot more like the American and the British version. Okay. Prior to the use of them wearing a steel helmet, this is the Kepi in Horizon Blue. So this was your primary uh, headgear for French soldier. First, first, at least the first two years of the war. Once again, they used puttees, puttees or for, for leggings. Yeah. And here's their service shoe. Once again, these are hobnailed. Slight heel plate here and a toe plate for wear. Okay. Okay. And here's your typical French infantryman. Um, post 19, you know, 16 and on would wear the steel helmet, but pretty much the uniform he's wearing is what I just described. Here's the long overcoat, and we'll talk about the rest of this gear here as we as we go down the line. Now, is that the show show? That's the show show. Okay. Right. First Semi-automatic semi uh, 
that would be an alliance with a machine gun, light machine gun. Okay. Early M LMG then. Yes. Uh, not very successful because unfortunately it, it fired a rimmed casing which tended to jam in the magazine. Okay. That was its real downfall. If it fired a rimless cartridge, it might have been a little bit more successful of a weapon, but the fact that it used the LaBelle cartridge, which was a rimmed cartridge. Um, here's the uh, French model 1917 gas mask. Oh, in a tin. In a tin. Why, why, is it, why is it in a tin? And not uh, a, uh... I have no idea why. Uh, the German gas mask was very similar in a, in a, a cylindrical tin such as this also. Okay. Uh, now, of all the equipment, I find the French equipment for World War I to be probably the most, well, uh, obsolete of the lot. Uh, the standard military weapon for the French Army was the Lebel rifle, which used a under the barrel tube magazine, okay. which required it to be loaded with loose cartridges. Now, this is this is very rare to see. This is a complete set of French World War One infantry equipment: leather straps, two front pouches, one rear pouch. Inside these pouches would be packages of Lebel ammunition. Wrapped in paper, tied in cord, very similar to how the Civil War ammunition was in this country, and the cartridges were loose in these pack, you know, in these packages, and in, uh, for, I forgot how many packages were supposed to be carried in each one of these. These are bellows; they kind of open up, but you had to load the Lebel rifle with loose ammunition to not use a clip. The uh, a, supp uh, a supplemental rifle which they adopted, the Berthier, was yeah. originally a three-shot magazine, which was then increased to, I believe, five, uh, with a clip. But the, the standard infantry rifle was a LaBelle rifle, and uh, it was probably, of all the weapons, it probably was the most obsolete-looking weapon that was used during World War I. <laughs> Um, and so, and, and along with the equipment or the accoutrements that went with it, yeah. uh, attached to the side of this would have been a the, the uh, bayonet frog, and all the other French equipment hung off of straps. Mm -hmm. um, here's your French 1916 um, or F1 grenade with the 1916 uh, brilliant fuse. This is pretty much what the United States copied to make a hand grenade out of. We quote unquote copied. Well, we adopted the yeah. French pattern over the British and that's pretty much what we developed our grenades. Yeah. This is their a grenade bag or their salt bag to carry the hand grenades in. Um, they also carried a French entrench, this is a French entrenching tool, very similar to the German entrenching tool. This one here is the uh, model of uh, 1879 entrenching tool. Russians also used a tool manufactured by the French, very similar to that. Okay. Um, the French uh, Adrian pattern 1916 helmet with its cover. With its white, cover. With a white linen, white cotton oh, wow. cover. This is very rare. This is an original white linen cover for a white cotton cover for the uh, Adrian helmet. So you put that cover right over yes, the helmet. Yes. And you could, they would, you could douse this with mud or dirt to give it a camouflage. Uh, this is in a little bit of a darker blue-gray hue for the Adrian helmets. They sometimes they're a little bit lighter. This is the darker. This has the infantry flaming bomb badge. Uh, in the French helmets, the branch of service was indicated by a badge on the front. The flaming grenade or bomb for infantry. Cross cannons for artillery. Um, there was a um, an engineer corps that had a shield with like a Roman helmet. Mm -hmm. There was also the colonial troops, which some people think they're marine helmets, but what it is, it's the uh, French coat of arms with an anchor. It's actually the colonial troops. So they had a different badge on the front of their helmets for the branches of service. These were pat patterned after the French fire helmet. Okay. Uh, these were not really designed as military or uh, infantry helmets. They were the French fireman's helmet was pretty much this pattern helmet. They just adopted the French fireman's helmet and used okay. it in combat. Um, this is con this is called. Uh, it, they carried this. All these items here will go into the French haversack. Once again, no equipment. They use straps, so you had to carry everything over your shoulder. This is the bread bag or the haversack to carry your food rations in. Okay. Inside, you would carry a utensil set. This is called the food container. You could put food in here to preserve it, keep it from getting damaged, keep it dry. Um, this is your cup. This is your cup. This is their, their mess kit or their Dixie. This is what it was being used to, to cook in. It actually has three three layers, three, three levels of this. Oh, okay. Uh, once again, personal uh, uh, bandage for a wound dressing, which was carried in the coat pocket. Soap and a soap container. This is actual, that's... That's real soap. Real, that's real yep, soap. real soap. Actual soap, issue soap from the First World War.
It's probably it's a it's a tallow. It's probably a lard tallow type soap. Wow. Here's a, here's a issue uh, clasp knife. British and French had clasp knives. This is the, the French version. Here's the French version of the uh, personal trench dagger, double-edged dagger for, mm. for close quarter combat in, in trenches. Uh, pretty rare. This is a French issue army blanket, something you don't see too often. Wow. And then here's the model 1877 water bottle, double spout, one for drinking and one for filling. Okay. And rise blue cover. Now, rumor has it that a lot of the French soldiers used to carry two of these. One that they would have would water down wine in it, and one they would carry with water. <laughs> Yeah. I'm and French. The French, yep. And then here's your model uh, uh, 1893, 1914 pattern, small knapsack to be worn on the back. And then the um, blanket and the shelter tent would have been rolled around, strapped around the exterior of this because as you can see the interior will hold probably very little. Okay. And then here's a French World War I shelter tent which is pretty rare and original wooden pegs. Oh wow, original wooden pegs. Ori original. Yep, those are the wooden pegs that go with it. Unfortunately I don't have the German display here and that has a lot of really nice unique oh, items in it also but we covered here the primary, we just covered here the primary countries of the I, war. I think we missed one spot back over there with um, the patches and the metals. Oh, we can go back over there. Let's go back over there. Uh, this is kind of unique. This is a this is a French World War I tanker's patch to be sewn onto the uh, onto the tunic or the or the or probably oh, wow. a tunic with the with the tanker, so you wouldn't be able to wear the long overcoat. This is just an extra badge and a couple of French uniform buttons. And uh, this is the French Victory Medal from World War One. And then here's two of their uh, lower decorations. I believe they're about the equivalent almost of like a bronze star is in the United States. Uh, and there's different. There's an oak leaf and a star. Designating, designating um, different. Um, I, you know what? I'm, I'm kind of. I'm not really up on a lot of the French, but I know that there was, there was the two. There was a reason for the two, the star or the oak leaf. Interesting thing about these World War One victory maps: all of the countries involved, yeah, uh, all retained the same pattern, metal and ribbon, okay. and the language was different on them. So okay. the Italian one, the French one, the British one, the American, all the same metals, and the language is just, just different, different on okay. them. Yep. Oh, wow. All right. And that's about it. All right, Artie, thank you so much. You're very welcome.